really hard to have to go between the uh, supplementary materials and the paper because mm -hmm. you want to read it fluidly, but you're going back you have to flip back and forth. So how many people have read papers in either science or nature before? Because nature's a very similar format. So about half. So about half if you knew what to expect. <laughs> It is, I mean, there are pluses and minuses to it. I think, um, you know, science calls itself Science Magazine. So the idea is the format's different and you really are supposed to be kind of telling the story of what you do. And because it's such a short format, you can't afford to have a whole method section and put in your supplementary materials. But that said, um, it does make it harder sometimes to follow the science, especially now that so many of these papers have such complicated in-depth Science to them, right? So it's no longer just I went and looked at this and found this, and here it is in, in my two pages. <laughs> but you have to. Read. But yes, that does make it more of a challenge. What how, what about in, given that we have that format to deal with? Um, how do people feel about the writing and, and the, whether it was understandable for the audience, right? Clearly, they're writing for scientists; they're not writing for lay audience. Was everybody able to basically follow the paper and understand their findings? I see some head nods. Maybe not enough. It's a little difficult with all of the abbreviations and things that I've read it like three times to make sure that. Okay. <laughs> so it was harder to follow. So harder to follow than the last one. For sure. Yes. Okay. Um, which I expected. I mean, part of that is the format, but actually more of that is probably that there were more complicated experiments in this one, right? So instead of just saying, we're gonna just look at this and be done with it, it was, we're gonna do these three things and then look at the results, right? So you had to follow the three things and then try to interpret what the results mean. Um, so hopefully we will make that slightly better today in class. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, overall, I thought it was a fairly, for the format, it's a fairly well-written paper, so if you have some background knowledge, say like the introduction, right? I felt like you guys should have a little bit of knowledge so that at least some of the sentences should have hit home, right? Oh yeah, we just looked at this, you know, and then I realized <coughs> the science gets harder. Um, they do have some bigger things. So for instance, they have those um, sort of overview figures at the end, right, of the supplementary materials. They didn't put them in the paper because it wasn't room for them. I found those almost incomprehensible. <laughs> Um, but you know, I they they had a reason for putting them in, of course, probably because they wanted it to be easy, and it just didn't work out the way they were hoping. But those things happen sometimes. Um, let's see what else about the intro. I think that's about it. Okay. So this is the abstract, and I put it up here because um, it's also a shorter format usually in science or nature. But there's going to always be a giveaway sentence, right? What if I want to look at this paper and I want to know what the most important thing about the paper is? What sentence in that abstract am I looking at? What would you say the critical abstract statement is here? Yeah? The last sentence. The last sentence, right. So, um, and that's often true in abstracts, but not always. <coughs> So our, our results revealed that glomeruli are designated as targets for sensory neurons expressing specific odorant receptors during a critical period in the formation of the olfactory sensory map. And here's what matters, right? Because we already sort of knew that odorant receptors, right, is what we just talked about in class last week, that odorant receptors are indeed used to help target the sensory neurons to the right place in the map. So the question is, can they do anything, or do they, you know, can they always do anything, or is there other rules? So, just to start and kind of go through um, what we've already gone through, but just to kind of put it in terms of this paper, right? There are some important things here. So um, one of those is this, one glomerular form <laughs> receptor rule, right, which they sort of point out. Um, so unlike external projections in other systems, in other sensory systems, um, in which you're maintaining positional information, right? That's one of the reasons we covered the olfactory system is that it's gotta be different because there's not positional information here. And so the question becomes, how do you set up this map? Because there is this rule that each neuron is going to express only one type of receptor, and then each glomeruli in the olfactory fold is going to receive input from only cells that express that one type of receptor. And, and how do you do that clearly has been a big question. Um, and because you need to maintain that in order to have functional sensory information go in, in other words, to have a useful sense of smell, you have to have this, it's a really interesting question. Um, so some of the things to remember is that 
that are important that we talked about last time is these glomeruli are very specific. So remember, um, I said there's less than 2% error, right, in the precision of the location of glomeruli within animals. So even though it isn't mapping a single thing, it's still a very specific map within a species. So just to expand on that a little bit, this is sort of what it looks like. So this is supposed to be an olfactory bulb, right? They stick out at the end here, right, in the mouse. Um, and in this one, what they've done is they kind of like <coughs> spliced it open so you can see because what basically happens is in either bulb, there's two maps, okay? Two olfactory maps, so to speak. Not positional location, but smell, smell coordination. Um, and basically, um, glomeruli, there can be between um, two and four glomeruli, right, for any one odor receptor. So you would have two on each side or one on each side, depending on the, the odor receptor. And there's these two maps. So if you were going to have two, you'd have one on this map and one on this map, right? Um, and it turns out that the cells, those mitral cells and the tufted cells that are in the glomeruli that are our, out, our output cells to go up to the brain, actually make connections to each other from glomeruli. So there seems to be, this isn't really well worked out, but there seems to be some connection between two glomeruli from one odorant receptor, right? So if you're the odorant receptor for M12, you're gonna have some connections, I mean, if you're the glomeruli, you're gonna have some connections to the cells of the glomeruli of the other M12 in that same olfactory bulb, if there are two of them. Okay, so that gives us a lot of interaction, right, between those bulbs, and so not only are they spatially mapped carefully, but there's interaction between the two that are matching, which means again, having them spatially mapped is in the right places basically is important. Okay. And so we talked about this last time too, but this is also gonna be sort of important for us. Um, you know, we're going to make this original map in two ways, right? We have some dorsal ventral patterning, I guess we have a little anterior posterior patterning, um, and we're going to use <coughs> olfactory receptors on neurons, right, for that anterior posterior patterning. Let's see. Um, once we do that basic patterning and get them to the right place, there is going to be, indeed, also based on odor receptors, right, but based now on information from the periphery, we're going to have some um, pruning of connections here, right, until we get these nice little perfect one right realized. So it starts out a little messier and gets better over time. And I'll talk a little bit more about the timing of the mouse as we move on to this. So that's the background, right? And what they wanted to know is whether this specific, whether these specific connections um, get made constantly, get reset up constantly, or whether we set them up early in development and then they just work the way they work. One of the reasons this question is so interesting to them are these cells. So these olfactory sensory neurons turn over all the time, right? So unlike a lot of other neurons that are just there in your brain, say, and you make them and you're done, um, there's almost constant cell birth in the periphery because these neurons are in the periphery and they can get damaged. So you have all this <laughs> constant turnover of olfactory sensory neurons, right? Just like you would skin cells or something, right? So these guys turn over a lot, which means they have to grow axons out and get to the correct glomeruli, all turns <coughs> like the animal. So that's one of the reasons they're so interested in whether this map is completely plastic. We know the system is a lot more plastic than a lot of systems, right? The olfactory bulb is another one of these areas in the central nervous system that has new neuron birth throughout life of the animal. So we've got plasticity at this end, and we've got a lot of plasticity at this end. And by plasticity, I just mean birth of new neurons that have to be incorporated into circuits to work correctly. So that said, if we have all this plasticity, why can't we just constantly rearrange glomeruli? And would that maybe be a negative thing? It might be, right, if you want a precise map. Okay, so here's how they start. Do olfactory sensory neurons use the same mechanisms to reach the target glomeruli throughout life, which is kind of what I just set up? Or does targeting during development actually shape map development in such a way that later born neurons choose their targets based on that map? And this should kind of take you back to some of the other discussions we had about targeting more in general. So this idea that, say, in the visual map, right, <coughs> we're making that map early on based on gradients of signaling factors in the target. And so where those, where those neurons from the periphery go in that case is based totally on what the target's doing and not based on anything in the periphery. 
But in this case, because we have this constant turnover, the rules might be different, and that's sort of what they want to do. Especially since we know that the receptors on the neurons have something to do with it. Okay, so just briefly before we go into the paper, um, they use this odor receptor MOR28, mouse odor receptor 28, and um, there is probably a reason for that. And I say that because you know there's a lot of odor receptors. But it turns out that um, this odor receptor has been studied a lot. <coughs> so compared to some, we know more about it. Um, the first paper that ever showed odor receptors that are on axon growth cones um, did so by developing an antibody to this odor receptor. This is a drawing of where it's generally located. There's three here because this paper is about all three, because those three have very, very close amino acid sequences, so they're very similar odor receptors, right? But I'm just going, I just want you to concentrate on ours. So that's MLR28. So this is um, ventral lateral and this is ventral medial. So remember there's two maps, one's kind of on the outside, one's kind of on the inside, and the one olfactory bulb. So MLR28, there's two glomeruli in each bulb, so there's four fold, usually. And there's one here and there's one down here, right? So the lateral one is up a little higher, it's a little more dorsal, and the um, medial one is a little more ventral. But they're not extraordinarily far away from each other in an anterior posterior way, which makes sense. Okay, so that's where we're starting with. So they're gonna take this odor receptor and try to manipulate it. Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> so are the medial and lateral the bulbs or the glomeruli? Are the what? The medial and lateral is within a bulb. So, you know, when you have, there's two olfactory bulbs. And so almost the whole time in, in this paper and in general, we're gonna be talking about one, right? But we have two olfactory bulbs, okay? And so when they're talking about, when I showed that map, that's taking one bulb and sort of kind of trying to splay it out, right? It's not the whole bulb, but in order to, it's just one of those things that's incredibly hard to draw. So what they're saying with, with any one ball, if you were to look down on them from the top, so let's pretend now I was like the, this is, you know, the brain's gonna be back here and we're looking down on the dorsal aspect. So if we have, we're gonna have a map that basically lays, you know, more on the outside and a map that lays more on the inside, right? Okay. <coughs> and then you'd have one glomeruli that's medial and one that's medial. Yes. Got yes. It. In most cases that's gonna be true because one's gonna be on the, the more lateral map. So what they're going to do is they're going to take MLR28, which we know a fair bit about. We know where about where the glomeruli and the bulbs are. Um, we know, we know what they're like. We know their amino acid sequence. We know a lot about them and how they function. This is the epithelium, and what this is is an antibody stain to MLR28. And so this is so you can see. You know, I said that the odor receptors are spread throughout the entire bulb, um, throughout the entire epithelium. But here you can actually see within the part of the olfactory epithelium, you've got neurons that are expressing this receptor all over the place, right? So they're not just in one spot. They are actually kind of spread throughout most of the olfactory part of the epithelium, which is this part out here. Okay. okay, so they want to manipulate it. So this is where things start to get complicated, right? Um, so they're gonna use conditional gene expression because they want to manipulate how this receptor is expressed, and they want to express it in places it, it, in cells that it isn't normally expressed in, that's probably pretty easy to do. But if they're looking for critical periods, if they're interested in timing, right, or temporal effects, then they have to be able to control when it's expressed. And you can't do that just by knocking it out or knocking it in or whatever, right? So you have to do something else. So this is one way that you can do this, and of course there are a lot, but this is what they do. They use this, what they often call tech off system. Um, and what that is, is this, this TTA thing, this tetracycline. Um, Tetracycline controlled transcription factor. 
And what they're going to use in this one um, by some promoter of interest, right? <coughs> um, that <coughs> that produces this TTA, which is a transcription factor. Okay, so TTA is a transcription factor. That's what it stands for, tetracycline controlled transcription factor. So the long, long name, not that you have to remember it, but it does tell you actually what it does. Okay, so they, they're gonna introduce this into the cells of interest by creating a transgenic mouse that expresses that factor in only those cells. So, what cells do they want to express this transcription factor in? Well, they want to express it in the cells that they eventually want to manipulate. And so what they're going to do, and I'm going to show this on the next slide too, but this is how they're going to drive it. I mentioned this guy last time, the olfactory marker protein. And remember, this is a protein that just happens to only be expressed in olfactory sensory neurons, right? <coughs> They're going to use the promoter for that gene to drive this. So that basically, if you're making OMP, you're going to make TTA. That's theirs. But you could do this with anything, right? You could do it with whatever you wanted to do it with. Okay. Then they have to make a second transgenic mouse. And that's going to express the gene of interest driven by a TET. And they're, they're going to call it TET-O. So I'll call it, it TET-O. TET-O promoter. So gene of interest. So gene of interest for them, of course, is going to be the owner receptor. Right? So well, how does this then work? Well, you have to breed those two mice together. And eventually what you get is this. You breed them together, and then you get expression of your gene of interest in your cell of interest. And the way that works is what tells the TET-O promoter to work is the binding of this transcription factor. Right. So once you mix this mouse with that mouse, then TTA is getting made in whatever cells you put it in that you know that there's transcription factors that are going to be making that protein, right? And it binds the TETO, and then it makes your gene of, gene of interest, and you're good to go. However, you can control it by using an antibiotic, because it is a tetracycline controlled transcription factor. So what you do is, if you give an animal, and it's almost always doxycycline, and that's what they use in this paper, then it actually binds to the transcription factor, and the transcription factor can no longer bind its promoter. So now, in the we have this gene, right, whatever our gene of interest is, in a bunch of cells, but it's not getting made because it doesn't have a transcription factor to tell it to get made. So it's just sitting there doing nothing. So in other words, if you get rid of this, you don't get any of this. And the way you get rid of that is by using doxycycline. Okay, so here's their version of doing that. Um, so they make this, their first mouse, right, they're basically making by using the OMP, the olfactory marker protein promoter with TTA. So that means that TTA is gonna be made only in olfactory sensory neurons, right? Okay. So if we give these mice doxycycline, they aren't gonna make TTA. And if we don't, they are. So then what we can do is we have another mouse, right? And we make these mice. And these guys are a little more um, complicated, but not much. So this is our TED-O mouse, right? So this guy is driven by <coughs> This little gene construct we make is driven by the TETO promoter, which means whatever is behind that isn't getting made unless TTA is in the cell, right? So until we cross it with this mouse, this mouse does nothing. So what do we put on this? Well, we put the promoter, um, I'm sorry, put the promoter for TETO, and then we put the MOR28 receptor. So when TETO gets turned on, that cell is going to start making MOR28, right? Even if it wouldn't normally. And it's also going to make this. This tau lac z um, is basically making, um, well, it's making beta galactoside. It's making something that's going to let us make the cells glow right now, which is what's going to matter most for you, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the first figure. So we have two things attached to this. When the TED-O promoter gets activated, that mouse is going to make more 28 receptor that, I mean, not that mouse, that cell is going to make more 28 receptor that it didn't usually make. And it's also going to make something that we can make glow red so we know where it is, right? That's just for a marker. Okay. Um, so here we go. We have the TTA mice and the TET-O mice. We breed them together, and we get this mouse. And this mouse has both. So if we don't give them doxycycline, what are they going to do? 
they're going to make more 28 expression in olfactory sensory neurons that don't usually have them. And they end up with two sets of these marks, right? They call them um, more 28 low and more 28 high. And basically, um, the low express them in only 1% of olfactory sensory neurons, expresses this extra more 28 receptor. And the high more 28s express in 5% of all the olfactory sensory neurons. Both of these, of course, are a lot higher than what you would normally see, right? In other words, what percentage would normally express more 28? However, if you feed mom doxycycline from the time she gets pregnant, and then you feed the pups doxycycline from the time they're weaned, they're never going to make this extra more 28 because the tetracycline, the doxycycline, sorry, is going to bind the TTA transcription factor, and so it can't bind its promoter, so we're not going to make anything. So this mouse, as long as you feed doxycycline forever, it's totally normal, right? Never going to have any ectopic anything, no transgenic anything expressed. It's just going to be a normal mouse, which is good because then that gives you a control, right? Okay. Um, let's see. I guess I'll do this. So this the one I have my marker right here. So neurons that have transgenic more 28 in them are going to, as we proceed through this paper, they're going to show up red. And they're showing up red because they have this lac Z gene put in, right? And that's making an enzyme. So now they have mice that any neuron that expresses MOR28 glows green. That's all. They can cross these two mice now, and then we get an interesting mouse, which is this one down here, which gets is going to show ectopic or transgenic, that's going to have transgenic MOR28 expressed, right, in some neurons, because we're going to cross our 28, and I said the MOR28 low, because they use the low expressing mouse in almost all their experiments after the very beginning. So I said the low, I chose the low mouse to put in this calling. So we, we're going to, if we combine the, the GFP expressing mouse and the more 28 low mouse, um, we're going to get this. We're going to get those more 28 expressing neurons that we wouldn't normally have. But we're also going to get to see all of our neurons that are expressing the normal MOR28, right? Because we combine these two. So that lets us see two things at once. Then we can see red neurons and green neurons, right? We're going to see the green neurons because we get to see all the normal neurons that normally make MOR28. And we get to see red neurons because we get to see this OSN-driven version, this you know olfactory marker protein-driven version of MOR28 that's expressed 
in sort of a random distribution, right? So you get this this one or five percent thing is due to kind of stochastic things that happen in the cell. Cells sometimes turn off things, and so they they don't you know they kind of gently say, well, it might, the reason we only get one or five percent expression is because of these things, but it doesn't matter. They only get one or five percent expression. So now we have a mouse without doxycycline that has red and green neuron, normal normal MMR28 neurons, and um, and transgenic MMR28 neurons. And if we give them doxycycline their whole lives, they're going to develop completely normally, but their MMR28 neurons would still be green, right? Because we're not controlling this anyway at all. We're just driving it with the MMR28 promoter. So giving doxycycline is not going to affect green ever. Figure. 
So remember, we normally have two MOR28 glomeruli per, per olfactory ball. But, um, and this is a wild type MOR28 glomerulus, and they say that because they, they do say in the paper they can't always tell. But when you see a glomerulus that's huge and totally green, that means you have lots of naturally MOR producing, MOR28 producing neurons going to that glomerulus. So it's very likely the natural glomerulus. And you can see a few red ones here too. What does that mean? It means that those cells that we may produce MOR28 that don't usually produce it are going there too, okay? But this is what they're interested in, these rerouted glomeruli. And that's what they're gonna call them the whole paper. And what a rerouted glomeruli is, is a glomerulus that gets projections from normally producing MOR28 neurons that we think probably shouldn't, right? They actually combine them all together. <coughs> so for instance, normally we have two per ball. The MOR28 low mice have endogenous MOR28 producing neurons that project to approximately three glomeruli per side, and the high mice project to approximately five glomeruli per side. Now there's a range there, right? So in a low mouse, right, because we're gonna mostly use the low mice, that means that instead of going to two per side, it's going to an extra, those MOR28 neurons are going to a glomerular <coughs> that you never normally go to. But remember, these aren't transgenic neurons. These are just the normal ones, and they're still going to the wrong place. So this is kind of where they ask their question, right? Because now they can say, we've got a way to alter the way the olfactory mass develops. It is not developing normally. And we're not doing it by making the neurons screwed up. It's not developing normally. Our normal neurons are not going to their normal place. They're going to a new place, right? And so then they say, okay, when does this happen? In other words, can I change how many MOR28, normal MOR28 glomeruli there are anytime? Or do I have to do it at a specific point in development? And that's what all the rest of their experiments are gonna kind of try to do. So. Here's their first thing. Of course, they're going to do this by either using or not using doxycycline. All right, so the first thing they're going to do is this. They're going to use the doxycycline to stop the ectopic expression during early development. So in other words, we know if we just let these mice grow up, these are the mice that are expressing everything, right, that we're going to have normal MOR28 expressing olfactory sensory neurons that go to extra glomeruli. So what happens if we dose them with doxy? And so they do three different, right now, I always have a little chart up here that shows you how much doxy they're using or when they're using it. So this they're doing it from conception to either birth or postnatal day seven, so a week after birth, or postnatal day 14, so two weeks after birth, right? That's the three experimental conditions. And here's what they find. Um, if they don't give doxy, so this is the picture we already saw, right? These are the mice that are just from the day of conception, they're just expressing ectopic more, or they're expressing transgenic more 28 neurons, and we're gonna get those weird ectopic glomeruli. So there's glomeruli, right? And there is, in the low, there's approximately three, but sometimes there's more like four per mouse. If you give them doxy from conception to postnatal day zero, right, there is almost never any extra glomeruli, okay? <coughs> and these are the rerouting. So if you do day seven, again, there's almost never, which means in one mouse of however many they tested, there would have been one rerouted glomeruli, right? By day 14, they don't see it. So if you get doxycycline from conception to birth, you never see a rerouted glomeruli. Now, you would see if you, if you were to then stop giving doxy and let them grow up and sacrifice them out here at eight months, you would see ectopic glomeruli that express, that, or that glow red. So you would still see all those crazy red glomeruli. In other words, the MOR28, once it gets turned on, those neurons go somewhere, right? But what you don't see is any green in those. So you never see anything but the two normal glomeruli that glow green, okay? Um, and at P0 and P7, you might occasionally see one. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that at P0 and P7, there's probably some plasticity still that's going away. In other words, whatever's letting the map choose whether or not to make glomeruli in certain places is not completely gone yet, right? But it's almost gone. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay, so the conclusion from this is there is indeed a critical period. In other words, you can't, you can do it before birth, but after birth, you can't really do a whole lot about it. 
So in mice, when this is happening, um, so I think the first neurons are coming into the bulb and starting to make connections to glomeruli, right? So they're using the olfactory sensory neurons to pick their place around embryonic day 17. So like within four days or five days of birth, right? And then at the end of the first week, <coughs> we have all that pruning occur and everybody gets very specific. So by the end of the first week, we have pretty much a set up olfactory map, right? So we have glomeruli that have projections from just those neurons and it's all nice and pretty and organized. Um, we have a lot of cell birth going on in the epithelium all the way to about two weeks and then it kind of settles down. So we have like all our olfactory sensory neurons born, sending their projections, they're all done by two weeks. But then of course we have this constant turnover. So we have a low level of turnover that then continues throughout the life of the animal and no new olfactory sensory neurons born. But that first wave is completely finished by two weeks which is explains sort of why they pick their um, those same times. Okay. So then they say, yeah, go ahead. Oh, so when we're talking about like the rerouting, it's only of the endogenous OS. Right, so reroute, the idea of rerouting, and it's this is a really important part of the paper, of course, is um, when they say rerouting glomeruli, which is really the only ones they care about. They don't really care about all the other ectopic glomeruli. A rerouted glomeruli is a normal, I'm going to call it normal, that's a terrible word, but I don't know what else to call it, more 28 expressing neuron, right, that goes somewhere it doesn't usually. It goes to an ectopic glomeruli. And remember, there's lots of ectopic glomeruli all over the entire olfactory bulb. But these guys, the normal, the, the neurons that are expressing just endogenous MOR28 don't usually go to them. And when they do, they say this in the paper, they only go to ones that are within about 650 microns of their normal one, right? So even though I showed that picture of the ectopic glomeruli all over the entire bulb, they don't get rerouted to all those glomeruli, they only get rerouted to the glomeruli that are pretty close, right? Okay. So that's what we got. Normal more 28 expressing neuron going to a glomeruli it wouldn't normally go to. Okay, so they, they, they show this and they say that means there's a sensitive period, right? Or a critical period during which this map is set up, after which it's kind of hard to change the map, right? In other words, if we give doxy and we stop and then we let the weird things happen, these neurons don't care. They still go to the glomeruli they already picked, right? So there is some sensitive period at least um, okay, so then they ask this, is the developmental critical period that they found um, simply due to neurons having axonal tracts to follow? So, you know, when we did the lecture where we talked about um, targeting, one of the things we talked about was it's a lot easier to know where to go when there's lots of other neurons going there. So perhaps they're just following the other neurons with some marker on them that go to the same glomeruli and they just grow back the easiest way. So what they do to try to test that is they use this drug, methamiazole, and what that does is it basically destroys all the olfactory sensory neurons. Okay, that's the goal, kill off, kill off all the neurons. And they show some of this data in their um, supplementary methods, but you know, there's a big drop in the number of neurons within about five days, and then they all grow back, because remember there is turnaround. But the idea of this is that there's going to, if they give this drug, there's going to be a period during which there aren't a bunch of axon tracks to follow. And you're gonna have to figure out how to get from the epithelium all the way into your glomeruli without just following whoever else is there. Okay, that's the goal. So here's what they're gonna do. They're gonna give doxycycline, um, they have two versions of it, but they're gonna start with this. They're gonna give doxycycline the whole time. So in other words, from conception till they're about four months old. And then they give the drug and everything gets destroyed, and then you can look at the end of this period, so when we're about four months old, and say, does everything go back to normal? Now in this case, we're giving doxycycline the whole time, so we never have any transgenic expression. So what we should expect is just two green glomeruli in every olfactory bulb, right? It should be just normal, more 28. They should go to the normal place, and everything should be fine. But you know, you wanna ask, if you do this crazy thing, do you mess stuff up? And the answer is no, okay? So if you give doxy the whole time, it's basically control, you get your normal glomeruli in basically the right place and you think all is good. But then what you do is this. You give doxycycline just to the point where you give the drug. So then you stop giving doxycycline, that means the mouse is gonna start making 
transgenic more 28 neurons all over the place. You give this drug which kills a bunch of the olfactory sensory neurons, and then when they come back, you're gonna have these crazy ectopic projections come back, and sure enough, you do. However, what you don't get are any rerouting glomeruli, right? So again, you're gonna get ectopic glomeruli, but they aren't gonna have any neurons in them from these olfactory sensory neurons that just produce normal MLR28. So there's still ectopic ones, but only with pro projections from the transgenic OSNs. Now, so here's what they say about that. These data indicate that the developmental mechanisms available perinatally when the olfactory map is established are not available for regeneration in the adult after olfactory neuron ablation. In other words, whatever's going on in the beginning that allows us to make the map more flexibly than usual, right? We usually only have two, now we have four. We can't do that later. Because if we let the animals grow up till they're a couple months old and then do it, give them all the opportunity to make weird glomeruli, they don't do it, okay? So there's some constriction over time that's allowing them to be less, less plastic, so to speak. Okay. So now they kind of, they ask the backwards question, which is, if you allow things to, to go off course, so in that case, in our case, it's gonna be, we let transgenic MLR28 be produced, then what if we then get rid of the calls? Can we get rid of other radical glomeruli? In other words, can the map be plastic going back to normal? And when we get into talking about plasticity, sometimes plasticity does go one way more than the other. Sometimes there's sort of a, a bigger hurdle to go an unusual way than there is to go back to what is averagely the way she thought. So in this case, what they're gonna do is they're gonna let all of the mice in this experiment, I mean, they do have some control for the mice, <coughs> but all the mice we care about are gonna grow up with no doxycycline, which means they're making ectopic more 28 glomeruli because they're producing transgenic more 28 in their olfactory sensory neuron. And then, at two months old, we're gonna start giving them doxycycline. And so what does that mean? It means that we're gonna stop producing ectopic or well, we're gonna stop producing transgenic more 28 neurons. They do this for 21 weeks. And the reason they do it is because they say it's twice the half-life of olfactory sensory neurons, which basically <coughs> means in that time you should turn over every potential olfactory sensory neuron in the entire epithelium. And did anybody notice how they did that? How did they figure out what the half-life was? Did anybody look at the graph? There's a little graph with little dots that go down over time. So they used a, um, an analog of BRDU. They just a different version. Um, and so what they did is they just labeled all the cells with BRDU and then they counted them at different days after the label and they saw them disappear, right? And the cells that had them were the ones that had just gotten in there. And you can do that and then you can kind of calculate what half-life is and then from there you can say, well, if we wait long enough, we'll have gotten rid of all of the neurons that were there when we started. So they give that exactly for a long time so that we make sure that by the time we take our samples and look at our glomeruli, we know there are gonna be no red neurons left, right? Because all of our transgenic producing MOR28 neurons are gone, they're dot, and they can't be replaced because we're getting back to cycling. Okay, so um, they have, I, I put two of the things up from figure three here, because in in the, there's some others on the next page, and the middle ones are controlled. So this is, they did it two, they did it two ways, probably just because they wanted to go that extra step and say, well, maybe eventually it's gonna change. It doesn't change yet, but maybe it'll change later. So first they give Doxy from two to seven months, so it's at about a five month period, right? And sure enough, what happens if you do that is you have rerouted glomeruli. In other words, the endogenously MOR expressing olfactory sensory neurons are going still to those three glomeruli they go to, or four glomeruli they go to, instead of their normal two, okay? And if you do it from two to 10 months, which is the other length of time they did it, they're still there. So either way, you still get projections of these naturally MOR expressing OSMs to ectopic glomeruli. And notice this is one of the first pictures we've seen where there's no red neurons. And there's no red neurons because at this point, we should have gotten rid of all these guys through cell turnover, and we're not making transgenic MOR28 anymore <coughs> if we're feeding doxycycline, right? So we turned that gene off. 
They did two experiments ago. In other words, they're just going to add this methamizol to kill all the olfactory sensory neurons off to hopefully get rid of the ability to follow tracks. So again, they're doing the same thing where they're going to let them grow up with ectopic glomeruli, and then they're going to chop out all of the um, transgenic MR28 by giving doxycycline. But at the same time they start giving doxycycline, they're just going to kill off all the olfactory sensory neurons. And so now we have when these guys get to start making, when we make, when we start making new olfactory sensory neurons in the epithelium, they have to make their way all the way to the olfactory bulbs by themselves, right? They don't have other guys to follow, and there are no MOR28 expressing transgenic neurons there. And so here's this is DNA from Figure Three. Um, so this is just their control, right? So in this one, they just never gave doxy. In other words, instead of just two months of doxycycline. They let them grow up with ectopic, they give this to kill everything off, and then they, again, sacrifice them at four months. And so here you have ectopic nuclei. In other words, you have rerouted glomeruli, right? Um, and you'll notice you have red neurons in some of these rerouted glomeruli. And why is that? Because you never gave doxycycline, right? Okay. This is the one they're interested in. So in this one, they did give the doxycycline. So we kill off all the olfactory sensory neurons, we make them grow back, but we make them grow back with no transgenic MOR28 neurons there, which means that that would give our normal MOR28 expressing neurons the opportunity to just go to their two normal glomeruli. But they don't do it. They go, in this case, to four, right? So this is one of the ones that had four instead of three. So you can see four different nuclei where the normally expressing MOR28 neurons are going. So again, this suggests that in a, in a way that's independent of just following your neighbors, right? That's what they're getting rid of by, by using this drug. Um, once the map has been set up, you can't change it completely at least, right? If you make four glomeruli where MOR28 neurons like to go, they are gonna go there. So there's something else that is guiding them, right? That's obviously clear. And they talk about some of the ways that can be done, but they don't really know. Um, but what they do know is that in a normal mouse, we wouldn't have this, right? So there's a point early in development when you can make these ectopic glomeruli happen, and then you can't get rid of them, right? So we do definitely have a period of sort of um, important, important um, plasticity in that system. Okay, so here's their conclusions. I'm gonna probably say a bunch of things I already said. Olfactory sensory neurons expressing the odor receptor are affected by other olfactory sensory neurons with the same olfactory receptor, um, at least in certain times during development, right? Because these guys are being rerouted by these other neurons that express the same receptor they do. The olfactory sensory neuron target or pathway <coughs> is somehow marked during this critical period after which altering the expression of odor receptors in other cells no longer alters the targeting, right? That's what we saw in those last few experiments. Once we've established glomerular connections, we're gonna keep those glomeruli doing what they do. Okay, so if olfactory sensory neuron glomeruli circuits are established early in development and become immutable or unchangeable, how does that occur? And they float a lot of ideas because they obviously don't know the answer. Um, it could be that other axons already on the pathway have cues for the newly growing axons. And remember, we got rid of all the neurons, but that doesn't mean that there weren't some pieces of, say, ex exoskeleton that, of those, of those, sorry, all axons that might have markers on them. So they can't completely rule it out, although it obviously seems less likely since they did this experiment of getting rid of all the, um, all the actual cells that were there. Okay, so there could be fragments that might move one way. Uh, there could be markers in the extracellular matrix. So remember when we talked about axon guidance, they don't have to just use other cells, they can use the extracellular matrix. So maybe the extracellular matrix has specific markers in it based on what neuron went through that they then keep going to. Um, <coughs> perhaps the postsynaptic neurons, those mitral or tufted cells, are expressing some either ligand or receptor, depending on you know, what a ligand or receptor is, that's a marker or attractant to the growing axon. And so when they get into the basic area, they say, oh, those are those cells we like, they're our friends. And of course, we've seen examples of 
targets changing what they express to sort of you know get neurons to come to them. So it could be that once that original <coughs> synapse is made, both cells change what they make, and then the target cell becomes an expressor of a marker. So that's another uh, possible. Um, I think that's all the ones that they cover. So. They obviously leave a lot of questions, um, but you know, what is the what would you say then? Okay, so I mean, they said this in the beginning, but now that we've been through the whole paper, what would you say is the most important finding? I mean, is it about the MOR twenty eight receptor? Is it about numbers of glomeruli? It's the fact that there is this critical period during which he's not. Okay, and so what would be, that, right, I would agree with that, what would be some of the um, downstream important things of knowing this? I mean, you can talk a little bit about, well, gosh, you know, what if there's, what if someone has olfactory damage? What, you know, what, could, what could we do? Can we get their, does their olfactory not come back to normal or is it disrupted and could knowing these things change this? But kind of in a more general way, right? Are there more, I should say that, are there, is there a more general way that this could be important information? That knowing that there are critical periods during which these things happen and how we can disrupt them or not apply to other parts of development. I think they, I think they said something about this in the discussion, so I don't really remember. So one of the ideas here is um, obviously there are critical or sensitive periods in a lot of these systems, right? And we just don't know a whole lot about the olfactory system, and so it's a little bit less um, understandable and maybe a little more complicated because we don't have as easy a map to find. But you know, one of the ideas here is that if we can find ways to manipulate things that change a map early in development, we know how to do that. And that maybe gives us the beginning of understanding how we can manipulate the development of a nervous system, whatever part of it you might like, right? early in development to change outcome, and that's because that's what they did in this. So I mean, it's not directly applicable, right? But that was kind of one of the things that maybe was in supplement that they discussed a little bit um, about the meaning of this. So I don't know, I might have asked this as one of the homework questions. Um, what would what would you do, when you read this paper and got done it, okay, first of all, does it make more sense now? Okay, so you might have a different answer now. So what, when you're done with this paper and you're thinking about the results and kind of what they mean and what they showed, what is your question? What would you want to know about next? It doesn't have to be an actual functional experiment. It can just be kind of a general, I wish they blah. No, nobody wants to know anything. <laughs> okay. um, you know, I mean, for me, one of the things that because I'm because I'm really just interested in the idea of sensitive and critical periods in general, one of my big questions is when is this, right? So they start at birth, and of course they pick their timing a little bit based on when the system tends to turn on, but I'd love to have a better idea of when this happens. So critical periods or sensitive periods tend to have windows that start and stop, and they tend to have slightly larger windows where you can change things, but it's a little bit harder. Um, and so clearly they have an opportunity with this mouse to modulate that, right, even prenatally if they want to, um, based on, you know, um, based on their findings in this paper. So that's kind of one interesting thing. There was a paper that came out in the same issue um, in which another group did something kind of similar. Instead of, instead of manipulating an olfactory receptor, they actually added um, a channel that's an inward rectifying potassium channel onto some olfactory neurons and not others, olfactory sensory neurons and not others, and what that did is hyperpolarize them. So basically it meant that the olfactory receptor that they expressed couldn't have the same effect it would normally do because they couldn't be polarized as easily, right? So, and that altered the map as well. Um, and so they were looking at a slightly different thing, but they came up with the same basic idea, which is if you alter the way these olfactory receptors work in one way or another, and they did it by altering how likely the neuron was to be polarized, then you alter where those neurons meet connections. And they did a lot of their work prenatally, which is another thing that you know I sort of wonder when I see this, is they started at P0 because they know that's when everybody's kind of first getting in there, but can you change things earlier than that? Because 
it, it is indeed something about the pathway that changes things, you know, you might want to know that question. So those are some of my questions. They haven't answered them yet. There, I mean, there are papers that have um, referenced this paper, but they're about slightly different things. So, okay, um, I think we're done. I don't have anything else to say about the paper. Does anybody have any questions? I know it was a complicated bunch of experiments. No. Yes. Early postnatally, when you have a lot of growth 
And then you, over time, we're going to slowly, it doesn't really show with volume, but we're going to slowly have a decrease in the number of synapses in adult. Um, this is showing you human gestation. And so in this case, what they've done is they broke it down into different areas. And that's going to be true, right? So when an area develops is going to affect when its synapses are born. That's just well, what synapses occur. That's sort of straightforward, right? So if we know different areas of the brain develop at different times, then we're going to have the, the biggest number of synapses occurring. In other words, the biggest numbers of connections being made at different times. So for instance, in this one, um, you can see visual cortex in a human happens very, very early, um, whereas prefrontal cortex and auditory cortex, the peak is later. And um, I labeled this down here so you have an idea. This is what this is about because the days, and I certainly can't translate that in my head. Um, this is about one and a half years, and over here where these are peaking are say four and a half to five years old. <coughs> As we know, you know, when you think about prefrontal cortex, is one that you guys probably think about sometimes. Um, you're going to have a you have a huge amount of synapses made, and then you're going to have pruning later, right? But we're we're going to stick with the making synapses part for today. Um, so let's <coughs> So this is synapses made. As we move on to talk about these and making specific synapses, I'm going to mostly today use a, the specific example of the neuromuscular junction, and I'll tell you why when I go to the next slide. But one thing to keep in mind is that we can kind of think about this development of synapses in two ways. One is physiological, which is the actual communication. So in other words, cell A releases a neurotransmitter, it binds to a receptor on cell B and causes some sort of postsynaptic potential change, right? The other way is anatomical, which were all those specializations I was talking about. What is it that really makes you ready to be a fun highly functioning, really efficient synapse? And those two things are going to happen on fairly different time scales. Okay. So neuromuscular junction. A lot of what we know about how synapses work comes from research done on the neuromuscular function. And here's why. Um, one is really, really simple. So you think right away about the brain, and obviously, you know, I showed you that video with all the connections. There's a lot of synapses um, with a lot of different neurotransmitters, and sometimes multiple neurotransmitters within one synapse, right? So that makes things really complicated. The neuromuscular junction uses one neurotransmitter and one receptor. It uses acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter. And it uses an acetylcholine receptor, specifically the nicotinic receptor, as the receptor on the muscle that receives the synapse. So right there is easy. And then, of course, this. It's easily accessible. There's no skull. There's no blood-brain barrier. It's right <coughs> here, right? So it's easy to get to, which made it easier to study. Um, in mammals, uh, we'll be talking about this more later, but in mammals, in once synapses are fully mature, we have one synapse per mother cell. Okay, so there's one neuron that synapses, I shouldn't say one second, one neuron that synapses per muscle cell. Okay. <coughs> um, but we're not gonna worry about that too much today. That'll come up later when we talk about changing synapses. Okay, so a, a neuro, the neuromuscular junction, the neuromuscular synapse, is very similar to other neuronal synapses, but there are some specializations, which you might expect because of course one half of our synapse is a muscle cell instead of another neuron. So I'm just gonna kind of go over some of these details. Um, we're gonna have three types of cells involved in this, right? Um, one is going to be um, the neuron, right, that comes in to make the synapse. The other is gonna be the muscle cell. And then the third one is the Schwann cell, which is our glial cell for the peripheral nervous system that's gonna wrap us in myelin and do some other things to kind of keep things functioning. And so we're gonna actually have this synapse kind of wrapped up and surrounded by Schwann cells to take care of a lot of business. Um, the synapse is going to be specialized on both sides. So just like with any synapse, here's what we have to do, right? Um, we have to have clustering of synaptic vesicles. So just releasing a little bit of neurotransmitter here or there is fine when you're just a growth cone, but once you're trying to function and have action potentials and cause a big change in your postsynaptic cell, you want that to be a lot of neurotransmitter release so you can have a lot of effect. Um, That's gonna be the biggest one that we focus on. I mean, we have things like we recruit Golgi apparatus, we recruit a lot of other proteins that are help, that are gonna help us say make neurotransmitter. And we're not gonna talk about that so much until we get to the nervous system. Um, we're gonna mostly talk about how do we make enough neurotransmitter and get it into vesicles, into the right place. Then, um, we have this 
in between the two cells, right, we always have an active zone. That's a typical synapse thing. In our active zone at the neuromuscular junction, we have this, <coughs> what's drawn as little brown squiggly stuff here, which is called the um, basal membrane, the basal lamina, or sometimes the basement membrane. I'm going to use it interchangeably. They aren't actually completely interchangeable, but for our purposes, they're going to be. And what this is is basically um, a protein layer that has a bunch of things in it that help actually help the synapse. So it's basically just a membrane, thin membrane of many different proteins between these two cells. And we're going to talk about how that's related to the synapse in a minute. But it's a typical, um, wrap, this thing wraps around the whole muscle cell, not just at the synapse. Postsynaptically, of course, what do we have to have? We have to have a clustering of a lot of acetylcholine receptors, for one thing, because without that, we would have no way to respond to the presynaptic release. And we also have this weird little thing here, which you can see that it looks like there's little fingers going into the muscle cells. That only happens at the synapse. So only at the postsynaptic area does the muscle cell do this. And these are called junctional folds. Um, and basically, they, I'm trying to see, yeah, so you can see over here. So these are actual photographs, electromicroscopy photographs, and you can see here, that's one of your junctional folds, right? And the basal lamina drops down in there, and the receptors are clustered around them as well. So it actually gives you more space at the synapse, among other things, right? So when we start out, it doesn't look like that. When we start out, the muscle cell looks just like the rest of the muscle cell. And what we're going to have to do is kind of create this whole picture you know, from nothing. Basically, our question is, how do we get from this to <coughs> this, right? Um, what are the growth cone and the target cell like before we first make contact? So that's where we're going to start. And I think I've mentioned this before. Um, growth cones don't have to have met their target or made a synapse to make neurotransmitter. And as a matter of fact, you can actually show that they're often synthesizing neurotransmitter and even releasing it in some <coughs> amount before they make contact with another cell. And one of the ways to do this is, um, is what's called idea that right, whether or not you get a whole action potential, you can measure changes in the inside of whatever your cell of, of choice is. In this case, we're measuring it in the pipette instead of in the cell. 
Um, but anyway, so you can see all these little deflections are EPSPs, meaning that when acetylcholine interacts with this acetylcholine receptor, that receptor is having a response, and then you can see that. So that means that the growth cone is releasing acetylcholine, and yet it's just a growth cone. It's never met a cell of any type, right? And that sets us up to maybe have really, really quick interactions between a pre- and postsynaptic cell, that the presynaptic growth <coughs> is already potentially releasing neurotransmitters. Um, growth cones also do the things that presynaptic cells do in other ways. So this is sort of another way of looking at the same thing, but the thing to pay more attention to this time <coughs> is the growth cones are going to contain the proteins that are associated with presynaptic release, and they have presynaptic vesicles, they're making those, and they're releasing them. So they're releasing packets of neurotransmitter the same way any presynaptic cell would. So what they've done here to show that is they have a growing growth cone and they place it in this dye called FM464. There's a bunch of different ones, that's just the one they use. And so basically what happens is, remember when a vesicle binds to the outside of the cell and opens up to release, it basically becomes part of the membrane. It opens up, the neurotransmitter pours out, and it closes back in. So what happens is, if you have it with this dye surrounded, if that's happening and you're having normal vesicle release, instead of just, say, dumping neurotransmitter or something some weird way, um, you should have this dye sucked back up into the cell, right? And sure enough, that's what happens. So you can show growth cones actually taking up a whole bunch of this dye, and then if you wait long enough, you can actually show them re-release it. So you can even show vesicle recycling. Right? So even before they make contact, they have some of the necessary physical makeup, let's say, to, to do what they need to do. And this is going to be true on the other side as well. So our target cell, which of course in this case is a muscle cell, um, is actually going to have some receptor clustering before <coughs> there's ever any neurons in the area. Right? So what this is showing you is, well, let's look at this side for now. Right? Um, this is acetylcholine receptor chain, okay? And this is a muscle cell. And so you can see there's this stripe, and you're going to see this a lot today. You, there's this stripe here of really dark red blobs. And this little inset is just a blown up version of that. So these are acetylcholine receptors. And it's not just one, it's a whole bunch. So that's why it's a blob. It's, it's, when I say cluster, we're talking lots and lots of receptors. And what this is down here is just staining of the motor axons coming in. And of course, what you can see is that there's motor axons coming in, <coughs> and there's a little bit of spread here, right, of different um, axons, and, but they overlap completely with where that's clustered, right? Okay, so that's what it normally looks like. So in this case, what you do is say no motor axons. What happens? So this is going to give us an idea of whether or not the muscle can kind of do the things it needs to do without any input from neurons. And you can see it's, again, the light's a little hard to turn up the lights but you'll see it um, when you download it. You can see in the middle here, there is still kind of a cluster of acetylcholine receptors. Now, it's not as organized or specific, right? And we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. But if you look at the blow up, right, where there are clusters, they look almost exactly the same as the clusters that are under neurons, right, where we have active synapses. Um, and this is just showing you that this mouse mutant doesn't indeed have any motor neurons. <coughs> So we have a little bit of ability for either end to be starting to do the things they need to do before contact is made. Um, but of course, it's going to turn out that the actual contact has a lot to do with setting things up. So one of the first things we have to do is the growth cone has to find where it wants to make its synapse, right? Um, on muscle cells, since that's what we're talking about specifically, the growth cone synapses at a distinct central location on the myofiber. Um, which is a myoblast is just a little baby muscle cell. A myofiber is kind of the next step, right? Um, the earliest synapses are often on postsynaptic processes, even if they're going to end up on the cell body. This is true in the central nervous system as well. So this is transmission. <coughs> um, and you can see this is a muscle fiber, and this is something that's actually called a myopodia, which is supposed to be like a philopodia. Right? It's a long <laughs> finger-like extension reaching out in the world trying to do something. This is not even another neuron, right? It's not like this is dendrite on the neuron. This is a muscle cell. Um, and so you can see they have these kind of <coughs> finger-like extensions. And what happens is when a neuron comes in, purple, in these pictures, purple is a neuron, green is the muscle cell, and white is where they're overlapping. It's drawn in, right? Okay. When it comes in, you can see these tiny little fibers coming out <coughs> of the muscle cell. 
And then, of course, as the axon starts to make contact, it too releases a lot more philopodia, right? Makes a lot more philopodia, is the right thing to say. And they're reaching out, and they actually overlap in several places. And then as you keep going, there's a little star down here. Um, and this is actually kind of supposed supposed to be um, kind of a lamellopodia-like area with, with a little philopodia in the middle, right? So it's a little hard to see down here, but it's kind of a soft, fuzzy green connection where they actually interact. And that interaction <coughs> is going to be both um, physiological, right? This is where we're going to obviously release neurotransmitter and hot response, but it's also physical. So not only um, do we have the specializations we're going to have, but these guys actually become sort of bound to each other in the same way that we talk about um, growing axons being able to, say, become bound with the substrate they want to grow on, right? There's going to be a similar process here. Um, okay, so these connections between the axon and the target um, are often mediated by some amount of interaction, even very early on. So what this is showing is that um, when axons see chemoattractants, they tend to depolarize. And when they see chemorepellents, they tend to hyperpolarize. So now I'm showing you an example um, from the central nervous system up here, but just so you can see it. So SEMA 3A <coughs> is something we talked about. Of course, this tends to be a repellent. And what you can see there is this is a growing axon. And if you expose it to SEMA 3A, you can see little blue dots, which means it's becoming hyperpolarized. If you expose it to netrin, which is a chemoattractant for this cell, it has this green and red area, and that's supposed to be showing depolarization. And this is all mediated by changes in calcium at this stage. Uh, and so you can then go down to our, our area of interest, which is the spinal neuron medium muscle cell, and you can show, you know, say, growing them in a dish, that if you allow a um, growing neuron in a dish to see a little myeloma, <coughs> so there is to make contact with it, and you have a calcium dye in there that basically turns a color when the cell increases a lot, of increase, has a big increase in calcium, it'll have that big increase in calcium almost as soon as they interact, okay? So in this sense, and this is where your physiological um, versus anatomical synapse difference a little, on a physiological level, a synapse can happen you know, almost within seconds, okay? And this is true not only for looking at, say, changes in calcium when they meet, but you can also look at changes in postsynaptic potentials. So um, synaptic activity is going to occur very quickly after the growth cone makes contact before the morphological synapse is developed. So before we have a big change in um, the, the, the in, in the, in the anatomy sorry, of the synapse. Okay, so again, we have this prep where we have a spinal neuron growing, and we're going to take a little myoblast, and we're going to stick it up against the growth cone and kind of see what happens. In this case, we have a pipette attached to the myoblast, so we can see if there's changes in our muscle cell once it makes contact with the growth cone, right? In other words, we can measure changes in the potential or even action potentials, as the case may be. And here, we <coughs> you put them together, and you can look at this. What this is doing is all these little downward deflections are postsynaptic. And you can see that um, within about 10 minutes, you have a lot of very regular, pretty large past synaptic potentials. But you can also see them sometimes, and they don't have any on here, but you can also sometimes see them within seconds. So within the first few seconds, you might see an EPSP. Um, but within five minutes, you're seeing them very regularly, right? So it's pretty quick. Um, this is just looking in a different way. So this would be within a few seconds after contact. So as I said, you can see a few small EPSPs right away. Um, but again, within five minutes, you're seeing large sort of organized downward deflections, which are what you see in a normal interaction of a synapse. Okay. So that's the physiological side, really, really fast. Um, on the <coughs> chemical side, there are some things that happen fast and some things that happen slow. One thing that happens relatively quickly is adhesion. So when I showed you that picture of the, myo, of the um, muscle cell and the nerve cell coming together and kind of reaching out to grab each other, there's some physical interaction that occurs here. And so to do this, we're going to do this a lot like, um, remember when we talked about axon growth, outgrowth, and we talked about 
growing an axon and then trying to sort of blow it off the substrate to see how sticky it was with the substrate. This is similar, except in this case, what we're going to do is let it touch the thing of interest, which is the muscle cell, and see if we can pull the muscle cell away and what happens. Um, so what they're going to do, again, we're just growing our spinal neuron and on a plate, and then we bring this little muscle cell and we put them in contact. And then we pull it away. And they're labeling grades of adhesion. So zero is basically I move the muscle cell away, the neuron does nothing. One is I move it away and I can see at least a tiny bit of one filopodia basically attached to it. Um, two is the majority of the growth cone comes with it, but it stays attached to the substrate. And three is I actually pull the entire growth cone off, right? Okay. So um, what this is showing is the labeling of those grades over time. So after one and a half minutes together, you already see a lot of your cells at grade one, but there's still a fair number at zero, right? And there's almost none at two or three. So in other words, one and a half minutes is long enough for some of the cells to start making an actual physical interaction that's binding, but not that long. However, after 15 <coughs> minutes, you can see that almost all of the cells that had come in contact with a myeloblast have now made a pretty strong adhesion, right? So that's longer than the physiological part, but still relatively fast in the grand scheme of things. Um, these increases in contact can be mediated by several things, but um, there are indeed our typical cell adhesion molecules at these synapses. So um, there is NCAM and um, and cadherin and some other cell adhesion molecules that are on both the spinal neuron and the muscle cell, right? That can be <coughs> this sort of <coughs> Okay. So once we get that first step done, we've come in contact, we've kind of hit a spot. What what do we do next? So um, differentiation of the growth cone into a nerve terminal is not surprisingly going to be partially mediated, mediated by the postsynaptic contact, right? So by our target. So this is sort of retrograde interaction, right? Because we're having the, the target tell the presynaptic cell to do something. So what I have here is basically a drawing. You're going to see a couple times in the next couple slides. And this is a little muscle cell, and this is a nerve coming in, and it's making synapses onto that muscle cell. And our little green dots are supposed to be the actual synapses. Um, and our receptors, sorry, the little green dots are supposed to be our receptors, and the little orange stripes are supposed to be our synapses. So here's the experiment. We cut the nerve so we ruin the synapse. It'll grow back in. It's a peripheral nerve. You don't cut it up very far, right? So you can cut it so that it'll grow back in. And then you let it grow back in. And what it does is it goes to the exact same spot that it was. In other words, when it's making the synapse, you can see these are very particular, specific little connections. And they may not have been specific when they first got made. But once they're there, if you get rid of them, they grow back into the exact same spot they were. Okay, so that means there's something about the target, right, that's telling them come back here once they're there. And this should sort of remind you a little bit of the last lecture, right, in that paper and what the olfactory neurons are doing, which kind of tells you where they came up with that experiment. So they go on to say, okay, so it's the postsynaptic cell. So what if we do this? What if we cut the nerve terminal and we destroy the muscle fiber, which you can do? So then you let the nerve grow back. And you know what it does? It goes right back to the exact same <coughs> spot it was before. So even though there is now no muscle fiber there for to make an actual synapse with, it still goes back to the same place. Which suggests something, which is that it's not just the muscle fiber, even though the muscle fiber might be originally giving the signals, it's got to be something else. And something else that's the most likely candidate and is the answer is the basal lamina. What's in the basal lamina? Well, there's a lot of things. But one of the things um, are some of our extracellular matrix molecules. So it turns out that laminins are really important in setting up the neuromuscular junction. Um, they are assembled in the muscle. Okay, So the laminins are made in the muscle and inserted into the cleft, into the basal lamina. And then what happens is um, they interact with the neurons. So they're involved in several things. Um, so they're involved in forming these active zones, which is basically telling the neuron, hey, you're going to make your synapse here, or we're going to increase <coughs> vesicle clustering, for instance. Um, and it tend, the idea is that they function through interactions with voltage-gated calcium channels all in the neuron. And so if they can cause changes in the opening and closing of those voltage-gated calcium channels, you can change what the post-synapse, what the 
inner potential of the neuron is, and that allows the neuron to be told things like, oh, I should make more vesicles, and they should be clustered here. Obviously, that's a complicated process. Um, you can show that by actually doing things like knocking out specific laminins. So it turns out that um, laminin 11 is really important, and there's a lot of it in the cleft itself. Um, and not so much of it outside. And so if you knock out one of the subunits that's necessary for laminin 11, therefore basically knocking it out, um, you actually don't get postsynaptic, or sorry, presynaptic specializations. So you sort of have an undeveloped um, presynaptic terminal that way. And you get, um, you get synaptic deficits overall as well. Okay, so that's one example. There are obviously others, like all things, there's redundancy in the system and there's more than one way to do it. So I just wrote these down here so you can see them. Um, FGFs are actually involved in setting up the neuromuscular synapse. Um, and they can all, they have also been shown to promote vesicle clustering. Um, and collagens, which are also in the um, extracellular matrix, can also induce vesicle clustering in spinal neurons, right? So we've got more than one way to do it. This is just sort of one good example. So that's the presynaptic side, right? That's kind of some examples of some of the things we might do to cause a, a specialization in our presynaptic cell to get it ready to be normally functioning synapse. And that's being moderated mostly by the muscle cell, even if it's indirect because the muscle cell is releasing something that is being put into the extracellular matrix or into the basal lamina that then can affect the presynaptic cell. So what about postsynaptic cell, right? We have to do the same thing. And not surprisingly, it's the same sort of story in the opposite direction. In other words, elaboration of the postsynaptic apparatus um, is often organized by the motor neuron, okay, by the motor neuron. So I'm going to show you an example of this, um, and I'm going to go through two different things. So the growth cone is going to organize the differentiation of the target, which is interrograde sort of signaling, right? Um, and here's the things we want to do in our muscle cell. We want to get all a big cluster of receptors into one place. When we start out with a muscle cell, before there's <coughs> synaptic contact, um, we have <coughs> receptors spread throughout the muscle. But as I showed you in that picture, there, there is one area of the muscle that tends to have a slightly denser area. But in general, we have this. Um, We have about a thousand receptors per micron squared. Okay. Once we make a synapse, um, we have about 10,000 per micron, micron squared at the synapse and only 10 per micron squared everywhere else. So when we do this, when we specialize this postsynaptic area, um, we are both adding receptors after synapse and we're getting rid of receptors everywhere else on the muscle cell. We're gonna do that in a variety of ways. Um, and basically, this is that. So some of them might translocate. In other words, they either diffuse into the synapse or they're endocytosed and then exocytosed back at the synapse where we want them. Um, Nuclei close to the synapse are going to upregulate acetylcholine receptors, nuclei close to the synapse. So muscle cells are a little different than other cells, and they have multiple nuclei, one muscle cell. So they're multinucleated cells. So there's going to be nuclei all over the muscle cells, and the nuclei right at the synapse are going to upregulate how much acetylcholine receptor they make, and nuclei away from the synapse are going to downregulate acetylcholine receptors, right? So we've got three ways of moderating. So I'm going to first kind of show you this example. So here we are with a little baby muscle cell, and it's got a acetylcholine receptor. <coughs> and then in the adult, here we have them all together, right? Um, so in this case, what, what we're going to do is look at the change, right? So this is um, transcription of acetylcholine receptors. And basically what they're showing here is kind of what I just said, which is um, if we really upregulate how much receptor there is in one place, how much receptor we're producing in one place, we're going to get a lot of receptors, and at the same time, we're going to turn it down on these other nuclei. This is just showing you an experiment to show you the change, although it doesn't show you how the change happens. So in this case, what they're doing is they label all of these acetylcholine receptors, okay? And this is before there's a synapse. And then you let a growth cone come in and make a synapse, and then you say, 
Well, what happens after it makes the synapse? Well, I'm going to relabel, right? After it's had some amount of time to sit there and make a connection, I'm going to relabel it all these sigmoidal receptors, but with a different color. So now you're going to have two things. You're going to have just red receptors. You're going to have just yellow receptors. And you're going to have red and yellow receptors. And if something's double labeled, that means it was there before the growth cone came in, and it's still there, right? If it's just yellow, it's new. And um, if it's just red, no, it wouldn't be just red, sorry. I've read just red, so I'm getting this up. If it's just red, it just means that it was there before, but it, it would have been bound yellow, too. Um, so in this one, if you don't add a neuron, though, then you can have that, right? So what happens is, if you don't add a neuron, basically, you have some receptors, um, but you don't have more. So the number of receptors is obviously going to be a lot lower. But almost none of the receptors, not almost none, but very few of the receptors are new. In other words, most of the receptors are just the ones that are there, not much change. There's some receptor cycling all the time anywhere, right? But where you have the nerve terminal, you're going to have a huge increase in the total number, and a lot of them are new. That could be happening either way. That could either be receptors that got moved there or more receptors got made, right? <coughs> so our basal lamina is going to be important again. Um, this is sort of the same experiment I showed before, but trying to look at the other end. So instead of looking at the presynaptic terminal, we're looking at the postsynaptic cell. Um, so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to denervate, right, cut the nerve, and we're going to damage the muscle fiber, um, but you can do it so that there's little baby, what are called muscle satellite cells, which are basically precursor cells, right, so the muscle can return. And you're going to cut the fiber in a way that it doesn't grow back, or cut it continually so that it doesn't grow back. Because you want the muscle to regenerate, and you want to look at what happens at the post <coughs> site when there's no nerve growing in, right? And what happens is pretty much exactly like what happened presynaptically, um, when the muscle grows back, it makes a, an entire postsynaptic specialization. Um, you can see everything here, right? So we have cl receptor clustering, we have um, all of our indents in the muscle cell, we have everything set up just the way it is, even though there was no nerve. Which again suggests that um, once the synapse gets made, something has to happen in the basal lamina, since we have neither muscle nor nerve fiber there, that allows the muscle fiber to come back in and say, make a synapse right here. Um, so the question is, what, what is that? And on this side, it's going to be obviously something sort of released from the neuron, right? And what it is, is a protein called agarin. So agarin is synthesized by motor neurons, and it triggers clustering of acetylcholine receptors. So here's, a, again, these are little drawings. Here's a cultured muscle fiber, and here is a cultural cultured muscle fiber plus agarin, right? Um, when they did this experiment the first time to show this, they actually used basal lamina instead of agarin, right? So they put basal lamina on and they showed it and then they were able to figure out the protein and it's agarin. Agarin is released from multiple cell types. It's actually, there's some agarin that's actually made in muscle cells. It's not only made in neurons, <coughs> but it turns out that the neuronal form of agarin is um, a lot more sensitive um, I should say that, I should say it backwards, that the acetylcholine receptors are a lot more sensitive to the agarin release from neuron, and that's going to be because of the sensitivity it has for its receptor, right? So it's a different isoform. Um, this is just an example of knockout mice. So this is wild type, which is just a drawing of that picture I showed you before, right, of the synapses in the muscle with an overlaid nerve on it, and it's all very organized and tiny and tight and lots of lots of synapses in lots of one place with a lot of acetylcholine receptors. In an agarin mutant, um, they die at birth because, of course, their muscles don't function, so they can't breathe. Um, the number, size, and density of acetylcholine receptors are greatly reduced. You can see they're not totally absent. There's the occasional cluster here and there, but not enough to be functional, right? Um, the postsynaptic <laughs> cytoskeletal membrane and basal lamina proteins are also disrupted, so the whole synapse basically looks abnormal. The whole postsynaptic area looks abnormal. Okay, so what does agarin ag do? <coughs> what does agarin talk to? Um, agarin signals through a receptor called MUSC, which stands for muscle specific kinase. Um, it is a tyrosine kinase receptor in muscle cells. Um, what we're showing over here, I think. 
And what we're showing over here is time of different things occurring, right? Okay, so this side, which is our red line, is acetylcholine receptor phosphorylation. And this side is acetylcholine receptor clusters. So basically what this is saying is, what happens first is acetylcholine receptors get activated, which is kind of what phosphorylation is occurring. And that activation um, and, the, and then the phosphorylation of the receptors is going to cause clustering, right? So phosphorylation happens first, clustering happens second, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But must phosphorylation happens even before that. So even before the acetylcholine receptors get phosphorylated, which allows them to then cluster, must phosphorylation is occurring, which means musk is being activated somehow. And sure enough, musk is indeed expressed in those muscle cells right as the first nerve fibers grow in. So it's expressed early. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, this is just showing you basically the same drawing, but instead of knockout of agrin, we're showing knockout of musk, okay? So in this case, wild type, right, musk mutant. Musk is a little different than agrin, because remember in agrin, it has the occasional cluster, it's just poorly organized and not functional. In a musk mutant, you have absolutely no acetylcholine receptors. So musk is absolutely um, critical for any clustering of acetylcholine receptors. And this is showing you an actual picture again, instead of just the drawing. So here we have a nerve cell, right? This is our control animal. We have these really dense acetylcholine receptors, clusters, and this is the merged in it, so you can see where they overlap in yellow. This is a musk knockout. The nerve fibers are not as organized, which makes sense, right? Because of course what's gonna happen is when they don't find a place to synapse, they're gonna kind of reach out looking for a better place. There are no clusters clusters of acetylcholine receptors, because these guys aren't able to make their proper synapses, and of course there's absolutely no, <coughs> order, so there's no yellow on that picture. Okay. However, it turns out that agrin doesn't bind directly to musk. So you can knock out agrin and show a deficit, and you can knock out musk and you can show a deficit that's almost the same. And you can show that if you don't have agrin, musk doesn't get phosphorylated or activated. Um, but this is the one case where that's not enough, right? Because it turns out that agrin doesn't bind to musk. Agrin binds to a protein called LRP4, which stands for low density. Thank <laughs> you. 
suppressor lethal and tumorous imaginal discs. Um, it's, it was found in Drosophila and like many things, it just got named for things it was doing. Um, so what TID1 does that's really interesting is it causes the activation of this protein, rapsin. Um, and it does that because it helps phosphorylate acetylcholine receptors. And when you phosphorylate acetylcholine receptors, they bind rapsin. And you can think of rapsin as the glue <coughs> that holds the postsynaptic synapse together. Because what it does is bind acetylcholine receptors to each other and to the membrane, okay? And so if you get phosphorylation of these receptors and activation of rapsin, and they all come together, then you basically stuck a bunch of receptors in the membrane really close together, which is indeed receptor clusters, right? So that's one of the primary, not again, not the only, but one of the primary ways that this agrin musk interaction is actually having this function of increasing the clusters of receptors to 10,000 per micron squared. Another thing that's been shown, but not completely worked out, is that um, activation of MUX seems to drive an increase in the um, creation <coughs> of acetylcholine receptors at nuclei right at the synapse. So not only is it actively causing the clustering of receptors, but it's also driving increased transcription of those receptors. Not exactly how yet. There's another side to this story, because what I basically told you so far is one way, at least, that we have of both um, increasing the density of receptors at the synapse and increasing the number of receptors that are made in the nuclei that are right at the synapse. But what about the whole rest of the nerve fiber? I mean, clearly we aren't, maybe if we have no musk and no LRP4 and no agrin, which is being released from the synapse, we aren't saying more, 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 but we haven't down-regulated how much receptor is being made at non-synapse nuclei, and so we have to do that as well. And it's gonna turn out, interestingly, that that's gonna be done by neural activity. So neural activity is gonna re regulate receptor density by turning down how much acetylcholine receptor gets made. Um, so, here's what's gonna happen. Um, when there's neural activity, so in other words, when the presynaptic neuron releases acetylcholine and it binds to the acetylcholine receptor, what's gonna happen? A lot of things are gonna happen, including, as we've seen, EPSPs. And when EPSPs happen, we have calcium channels that open. And when calcium channels open, we do a bunch of things. Calcium causes a lot of changes in the cell. Obviously, it can change the synaptic potential of the cell, but calcium itself activates a lot of proteins. And one of those proteins is CAM kinase 2. And CAM kinase 2 has a lot of jobs. But in this case, one of the things it does is it activates this uh, or so to say, phosphorylates, thing show up? Yes. it phosphorylates this protein called myogenin. Myogenin is a transcription factor, but myogenin, when it's phosphorylated, is gonna do the opposite <coughs> thing that I've always told you phosphorylation does, which is to say that when myogenin gets phosphorylated, it's been shown that it can't function as well, okay? So it's the opposite. Usually we phosphorylate something and it does whatever it's doing better or it does it more. But in this case, it's gonna do it less. So when there's an increase in calcium inside the cell and CAM kinase 2 gets activated and it phosphorylates myogenin, myogenin cannot cause transcription of these acetylcholine receptors, okay? And so that's kind of what we're showing there, right? So activation of the acetylcholine receptors allow calcium influx that leads to downregulation of receptors in non-synaptic nuclei. Um, you can show that that happens by doing this, so if you cause there to be absolutely no release of neurotransmitter from the presynaptic neuron, then what happens is um, you allow acetylcholine receptors all over the muscle membrane. In other words, clustering is inhibited. And the number of receptors in other places go way up, right? So there's still gonna be some clustering where the synapse is, but not as much. And you're gonna have more receptors outside of the synapse. So this all sounds fine and good. I mean, this is a Right, easy to understand thing. We let calcium in, we activate CAM kinase 2, we phosphorylate myogenin, it can't do its job, it doesn't make receptor. But why only at nuclei that aren't at the synapse, right? Because obviously it's happening at the synapse too. So the way to think about this is that, like everything else, there's a balance, okay? So there are at the synapse through these things like agrin must signaling, and there are other signaling 
there's other signaling between the pre and postsynaptic cell as well. There's this big push at the synapse to have more receptor, right? So we were turning up transcription of acetylcholine receptors at the synaptic nuclei by interactions that occur only at the synapse. What's interesting about this part, the way this signaling occurs is calcium increase or changes <coughs> in calcium can happen throughout the whole cell. In other words, once we get big enough EPSPs, right, we're going to open calcium channels everywhere. So we can have this effect of decreasing myogenin's regulation at acetylcholine receptor across the whole cell. Whereas things like agar and musk are only having an effect right at the synapse, right? So at the synapse, we have this big <coughs> positive signal. And away from the synapse, we have this, away from the synapse, we have only negative sin signals, right? Assuming we do have a synapse to create these signals. So this is just an overview slide of that, of kind of what I just said. So we have coordinated action of positive and negative signals in assembly of this neuromuscular postsynaptic part of the neuromuscular junction. So on the positive side, we have things like agarin interacting with LRP4 and MUSC, which is causing the clustering of acetylcholine receptors, right, through activation of rapsin. Um, and is also increasing um, the amount of acetylcholine <laughs> receptor that gets made right at those nuclei. Um, and it turns out the reason this is on here is it actually also increases the number of musk receptors being made, right? So actually activation of musk increases musk self regulates the level. On the other side though, when acetylcholine gets released and activates receptors, we have calcium influx. And as we have that EPSP occur, we have <coughs> calcium influx everywhere. And as calcium comes in, it activates CAM kinase and some other things, uh, but we're just going to think about CAM kinase affecting myogenin, and then we're going to turn down how much acetylcholine receptor we make, right? So we're going to do both at once, and that way we can turn, that's how we get from 1,000 <coughs> per micron squared to 10,000 the synapse and only 10 everywhere else. Okay, and then the last thing that I'm going to talk about today is <coughs> to pop into the central nervous system Oops. is, um, so this is talking about mostly the anatomical differentiation that we have to do, right? And so we talked about both physiological changes in the synapse and anatomical changes. So this is taking longer, right, than it is to say, just put together um, a myoball and a neuron and say, oh look, we have some cell adhesion. We have some cell adhesion molecules interacting here and we have some actual physical connection. And of course, we're releasing neurotransmitter and starting some of these changes almost as soon as the growth cone gets within you know, aiming distance of the um, muscle cell. But the physiological function of a synapse can actually also be slow in some senses. Um, and it can be, when I say slow, I mean slow over weeks or months. Because it turns out that early in development, and we'll talk about some other examples of this um, in the central nervous system next class. Um, in general, throughout the nervous system, this can be true centrally and at the neuromuscular junction, Immature synaptic potentials tend to be very long, okay? And as synapses mature, they tend to get much shorter. Um, and you can imagine a variety of potential reasons for this, and I'll show you some examples of why it might be really <coughs> relevant um, later, but it might be that early on, you need longer, longer EPSPs in order for them to basically come together because you have less synapses and less organized synapses and maybe less neurotransmitter. And while you're trying to get your synapses set up, you want to be able to have a big effect. And you can have a bigger effect if your channels are open for a longer period of time. And it turns out that's often how you mediate this. So one of the ways to get longer synaptic potentials is if you have a channel that's going to open, you just leave it open for longer. Because then, of course, you can have more things come either in or out of it, depending on which way they want to go. So um, in the muscle fiber, the way this is done is actually it's done by changing what subunits the receptor expresses. Um, and so the two really important ones for this are going to be um, sigma and epsilon. So early on, we have receptors, and we have a lot of sigma. And then what happens is, as there is almost no epsilon, <coughs> Um, 
Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, early on, we have whole lots of gamma. And later on, we have a whole lot of epsilon. And you have almost none of these subunits early on. And you can basically show through experiments <coughs> things like if you just insert receptors into the membrane of the cell in culture that wouldn't normally have acetylcholine receptor, where you can make, this, make the receptor up of whatever you want to make it up of as. When you have these um, gamma cells, or sorry, these gamma receptors, they tend to open for a very long period of time. And when you put in epsilon, they open for a short period of time. There's another difference between these two receptors, too. The mature acetylcholine receptors open for a short duration, but they actually allow more through in that tiny duration. So you have a bigger effect in a very short amount of time. Whereas the immature receptors have a smaller effect over a longer period of time. So you have, you're open for longer, but you don't cause quite as big of a change in potential in any one minute of time. And not minute, but any one unit of time, would you want to say, because obviously these are still short, relatively short. So this is just showing you um, in mouse sort of how this change happens, right? So by P16, the muscle fibers are looking relatively mature. In other words, you have a makeup that you have in an adult almost. Um, and that's basically two weeks. So it basically takes the first two weeks of postnatal life to really get these receptors where they're going. And we'll see examples in the central nervous system next time <coughs> where there are changes that happen <coughs> in a much longer period of time. Um, Changing how we make up the receptor is maybe the most common way that, to modulate what the receptor does or how it does it, but we're going to see at least one example of um, something completely different to regulate what receptors can do and how they do it. Um, let's see, I have anything else I want to say about this. Yes, so... So I'm not going to go on to central synapses today. I'm going to wait till next time because I want to do them all together. Um, but let me say that we're, I'll just end by saying that we're going to go through the same process.